Hello, you are? Hello, John. How is Miami? Beautiful. Okay, okay. Beautiful. I walk out, I walk on the streets and I go, Why, man, I, I can't believe people can't live here. <laughs> <laughs> It's beautiful. So how's it going? Are you working hard? Yeah, I, this, uh, there's some some cases in western China, Xinjiang. Oh wow! So you they, travel? You travel? No, no. There are only 42 new COVID cases, so very oh. strict control now when going to hospital. Oh really? You can, you can't travel within China. It is possible, but it is uh, for foreigners is difficult. Oh, okay. Okay, we'll be starting. Oh, Victor's here. Good. Is uh, you been here? Not yet. Ben usually comes at the last minute. Yeah, uh, yeah. He was asking me to join here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, well, he's not here yet. He's coming. He sent a message that. Hey, hey, Victor. Hi, Hello, how are you? Hello, Good morning. Victor. Hello, the, Professor Yuha. This uh, webinar is going to be unforgettable because of uh, the presence of uh, Dr. Yasser Hill. Yeah, it is a presentation he sent to me, so he's not live here. Ah, okay, but... Uh, Oh, because he sent me three presentations and uh, we will give them all now during yeah. the end of the year <laughs> so because of time difference is uh, difficult to adapt. Yeah, yeah. It's very nice to see you, Dr. Yuha. Thank how you, thank you, you very much. How are you in China? Is, 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 things are okay. Yeah, I just accept the COVID situation makes traveling impossible. So you cannot actually you cannot travel anywhere because if you come back, then you have three weeks jail-like quarantine. This is strict yeah. quarantine. This is not not like in Europe or I don't know how it is in Mexico the quarantines, but here you cannot go anywhere. Get yes. food through the door. And the door is sealed, so you cannot. Wait. Yes, in Mexico, um, we are uh, maybe in next uh, month or next two months, uh, things are going to be worse uh, because uh, COVID is, uh, is uh, the contact is uh, increasing. This yeah. is increasing. So this is no, also Europe, Europe, southern part of Europe, Middle Europe, Germany. Yeah, yeah. Same. Italy, Spain are terrible. Same thing. Yeah, it's horrible. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Yuha, I'd like you to meet Ibrahim Salamov. Hi, Ibrahim. Hello, Dr. Man. How are you? Hello, Abraham. Yuha, Yuha, he, you're going to hear from Abraham. He's going to, he's a, a Russian superstar. <laughs> I know his name, yeah. Hello from yeah, Moscow. You're, you're going to hear from him. You're going to hear from yeah, him. Yeah, certainly, certainly, certainly. Yeah, he's very, very active in social media. Uh, and I'm no. trying to get, get him to get Russia, the Russian neurosurgery community together. <laughs> so... Yeah, how, how's it going? How's it going with your online activities, Ibrahim? Can you hear me, Ibrahim? Hello. Yes, yes. Yeah, muted. Yeah, muted. I know. Ibrahim, how are you doing with your online activities? Okay, fine. Uh, uh, now I work a lot. Okay, I can't really see you there. Okay, okay. Well, you're staying active. That's good. Okay, let me see. We start in 15 minutes, you, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yasser going to come in, right? Yeah, I will. I will tell two minutes about my connection to Yasser Gill, 
and then he will give the lecture, and then Subin will finish with the present state of Bible surgery, short lecture. Okay. This is the plan. I think okay. the Professor Yasakil's lecture is around one and a half hours. Okay. Are you, is he going to come, or are you going to play a video, or what, what's going to happen? This video tape. He sent me three videos taped. Oh, okay, so you're not, you're not, you want, you want to practice screen sharing now? You want, are you going to screen share them or, or is Z going to do that? Subin is there. So Subin oh, okay. Can... Yeah, he's here now. Hi, hi Ben. Hi, hi, hi. Hello. Okay, so you're. Hello, you're... Professor Yohan. Hello, Subin. Hi, hi, Victor. Hi, how are you? Hi. So you're going to play. You're going to play the videos, uh, Ben? You're going to screen share uh, so the video? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, you, ha you want me share the video or you share, share it? You, you, you show. Because okay. my well, you know, video is not running. Oh, OK. Well, oh, your video know. is not running? OK. Did you try your video? <laughs> well, we're asking a lot of Ben. I mean, you have to translate and screen share. <laughs> Okay, no problem. You can do that? <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's multitasking at its best. Can, is, is, Z, can Z, is Z there, you huh? Can he screen share? He, he can't? Like, oh, your video's not working? Okay. Okay, so that solves that. I enjoy very much yeah. to have the chance. Oh, okay. There we go. To talk to you. Okay, now it's good. To, uh, tell yeah, a little. Yeah, we can hear it well. We can hear it well. And I like to thank Professor Hennes Niemi. He asked me to participate on these lectures. Okay, is this video okay? Yes, it's good. Yeah, Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. It is good, clear. Good, good. Okay, that the human you. being have been well. Well, you know, you know, man, and uh -huh. I think once you started, it, it won't be much work. You know what I mean? Uh huh. Once you start okay. the video, you won't be that busy until you have to stop it. You know? Okay. So I think you can do it. Okay. Hello, John. Hey, man. Hello, how you doing? How you been? Hello, hello. You know, Man Manuel's in Russia also. He's in Moscow. Yeah, uh, Manuel is there. Hello. Hello, Manuel. Hello, Professor. Hello, Manuel. Hello, Professor Victor. How are you? ¿Cómo está usted? Hello, how are you, Manuel? Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. See, Victor is telling me mucho. Está tiene lunes, ¿verdad, Victor? Yeah. <laughs> Next Monday. Yeah. Tal vez yo puedo decir algo de esto. En este programa, como televisión, anuncios. Ben, we're going to be full. I think we'll have 100 panelists anyways. 
You know, Ben, how do, how do uh, the Chinese uh, medical students and neuroanatomy, is it like the United States, uh, there's kind of a shortage of cadavers? Yes, we still use cadavers. Oh, you still use them? Yeah, yes. yeah, this country we still do. I think in the mm -hmm. big city centers are cha mm -hmm. changing to, uh, you know, digital. Uh, simulator. Yeah, simulator, something. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, and in, our, in our university, we still use it. Uh, yeah. 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 We hope to have a 24 hour day neurosurgery channel, <laughs> neuro, neuroanatomy channel. <laughs> So that any time a student wakes up, he can go to the neuro neuroanatomy channel and participate in live neuroanatomy lectures. What do you think, Victor? Uh, for the students, it's uh, very nice. Yeah, you. Uh, what do you think? What do you think uh, if we have a twenty-four-hour day neuroanatomy channel? <laughs> <laughs> there are also other organs in the human being. Well, you know, yeah, I know, but I mean, neuroanatomy, especially uh, neurosurgery. Yeah, this is, this is super. Yeah, that, we can do it now. We can do it with this technology because the world, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the world, you can have, you know, yeah, you yeah. can have videos going from one part of the world and uh, it can be done. It just needs to be arranged. It's coming. Right, Victor? Yeah. <laughs> Victor's going to be there. <laughs> okay. But you'll get some sleep, Victor. Then the Chinese people have to give their lectures live, interactive. For residents, for the students, for it's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, Not only neurosurgeons, but anyone studying neuroanatomy. Yeah, yeah. The market of neuroanatomy is like probably fifty percent neurosurgery, and there's other areas that that uh, study it. Oh, let me change my background. This is not. Uh... Hold on. Uh -huh. Is it cold yet in Russia, Manuel? Well, the question is when is no cold here? Oh, it's not cold at all, huh? No, it's cold. The question is when? When it's no cold? Oh, when it's not cold. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's uh, no, almost November, so that's winter, winter time there, right? It's, it's something like uh, uh, August, July, and June, it's it's warm, but the people here say it's hot. All right. But you, you know, I, I came the, from the Caribbean, and hey, hello, you know, man. For me, hello. What? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Manuel. I'd like you to meet Ming Lee. He's a neurosurgeon from Boston, right, Ming? I right now I will join Professor Juha's group. Oh, okay. Oh, very good. Yeah. You are, you know Ming, right? Of course. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. We got six minutes. Yeah, there was a big skull based uh, webinar yet last night with uh, Dr. Borba. It was, it was very good, yeah. Yeah, that was a good one, right? Uh, I, uh, you I know, join also. Tomorrow morning it is five o'clock, and Sunday morning five o'clock. Oh, you, you're gonna uh, in his, join. Oh, you're gonna have another webinar? No, I will join. Oh, okay. MFT webinar. It is five yeah. o'clock here in the oh, morning. Oh, okay. Yeah, he has right, right. He, he, they have it's it today. Five, 5 p.m. Today and tomorrow they they have it. Yeah. yeah. Same same time. And I thought three days. Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday so was, was the first day. Morning, tomorrow morning and then Sunday morning. Right, right. Or our morning. So or I don't know morning. Yeah, the, the day ahead. Yeah, to have a panel of neurosurgeons, not only one, but nine. Not nine or 12. 
you know, commenting on things. That's great. Yeah, it was heavy discussion. I, I was in the first three hours, so I was heavy discussion with the panelists. You know, I don't understand a lot of it, but I still, I still love to listen to it. Uh, that type of interaction, because I know it's good. I don't know what it is, but I know it's good. Yeah. Five minutes. The videos are about a half hour? No, one and a half. One and a half hours? Yeah. No. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Ben, I you'll be okay. Professor Yasak, you cannot speak 30 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's giving all his experience. So experience is so large, it takes a long time yeah. to tell. Okay. So I think uh, once he was given 10 or 15 minutes in the USA, so he he couldn't manage, so he didn't speak anything. Okay. Uh, Abram is here also. Abram Arham. Abram, hello. Okay, three minutes. Oh, Joanna's here, great. Joanna. Hi guys. Hey Joanne, Hi. How, how you doing? I'm fine. How are you, John? How is everybody? You got uh, you hi. Hey. Joanne is Joanne is here. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Hey, hey. Hey. Kovasti tsemppiä taas tähän esitykseen. Todella upeeta. Mahtavaa. Abra is here also. Abra from Indonesia, National Institute. Oh, you can see the panelists, you are? You can see? I can see, oh, but okay. they are. Yeah, we're going to be full. A lot of people come at the last minute. Yeah. A lot of people. Okay, one minute. Oh, good. Okay. 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 Let me just buzz these last people in and then we'll start. Oh, excuse me. People come at the last minute.
Okay, here we go. You got 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Hold on. And then we'll start. Hold on. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett televising from Miami Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. We are blessed today to have uh, UHA's Neurosurgery Grand Rounds, and, and, and UHA has arranged for uh, kind of a televising of Yasser Gill, uh, Dr. Yasser Gill, and he's going to uh, give an introduction. Uh, and we also are, are being televised into Chinese by Ben Zhu. He's good enough to, to get us hooked up with the Chinese neurosurgery community whom Yuha is trying to reach. Okay, I'll let Yuha run the show. Okay, Yuha, it's all yours. Thank you, John, dear colleagues. So I have a very short introduction because Professor Yasakin doesn't need any introduction. Uh, 50,000 neurosurgeons in the world. If you don't know the name of Yasakil, you are certainly not a neurosurgeon. So Professor M. Kasi Yasakil was born in 1925 in Turkey with 18 years during the Second World War. He moved to Germany to study, but uh, then moved to Basel, Switzerland, and from there continued to Zurich. So he's the greatest neurosurgeon of all the times. His lifetime work was in Zurich. After retiring in Zurich, Switzerland, he moved to Little Rock, to Almefti and Ali Christ. And after finishing in Little Rock, he moved to Istanbul, where he's working with uh, Professor Gurdure, joining the operations and the writing heavily. So what's special in Professor Yasakil has a strong will, extremely hardworking. No one can work so much. He's still active at the age of 95 years and speaking about biopsies. So he did first STA MCA biopsies, October 30, 1967. This was a patient with Marfan syndrome and MCA occlusion. I was second year medical students, also with small medical students were following what was happening in the special world of neurosurgery. It was revolution happening. This is Professor Yasakil, later pictures, and here is Professor Yasakil with his uh, balance microscope. You see the mouth switch and also the armrest for surgery. These are very special. Everything was designed by him to begin micro surgery, all the instruments and all the things. This is during my medical study times in Zurich. This is 1969, so it is a long time ago. I was working by Professor Aket in Brain Research Institute in Zurich, and there I learned to use the microscope, the first microscope, open with one, assisted now here by Professor Ezra Kavana, coming from Tokyo, Japan. I studied in Zurich 1966-1973. And then after that, I went to specialize to Helsinki. After specializing in Finland and working in Kuopio, I felt I need more, more to study. And then I went to Zurich in 1982. I have many visitors around the world. And because it was not possible to change any uh, words in the operation room, after two operations, we went in a restaurant and then we discussed the beautiful operations of Professor Yasakil. He was number one. Then there was nothing. And then some in the third place that time. And we sucked all the the, all the knowledge and skills, what we could see there. So later I went several times to Zurich and finally when I became chairman in Helsinki, I invited Professor Yasakil to operate on, to give lectures and to operate on in Helsinki. He came 2001 and this was the first year of Helsinki's life course. He continued to come 2002 and 2003. 2003, this picture was drawn by the 
by my first Chinese fellow, Hu Shen, you see Professor Yasakil to operate on, assisted by me and Mrs. Diane Yasakil. What is special in this picture, all people look, look Chinese because these are Chinese eyes looking at the European people. So this was Professor Yasakil in Helsinki and he finished 2003. Then he was followed by two of his students, Ali Christ here in the back row, left Ugur Dure, there is Reza Dasti, my fellow, now in New York, and in the front row, Mika Niemela, the present chairman in Helsinki, in the middle, Evandro Oliveira from Brazil, and me. And this is Istanbul 2018, in the World Congress. Yasaki was giving a good lecture, and he's still active writing a book. So let's learn with master, with, with the master of masters. We play now the Paibas lecture. Thank you. We're going to switch to Bin now, right, Yuha? Yep. Okay. Oh. Dear Professor Yuha Hennesniemi, dear colleagues in Republic China, I enjoy very much to have the chance to talk to you, to uh, tell a little from my experiences. And I like to thank Professor Hennes Niemi. He asked me to participate on these lectures. It is clear that the human being have been since millenniums interested to control the bleedings by injuries and they have been very irritated how, and to see how young or old people may die by bleeding. So the blood vessels have been very important. Sure, the human being had also experiences by animals. They saw different type of vessels and they saw the importance of this vessel system. I'm going to tell you now a little more about the human brain vessels. In contrast to many other organs, the human brain has a history. The history is the co-evolutionary phylogenesis, ontogenesis, and epigenesis. The human brain developed through hundreds of million years or so of co-evolution, numerous specific structural regions and distinct, distinct functional circuits. Each topos in the brain is linked in the chronos, in the areas and functions of the brain is directly related to a certain phylogenic, ontogenic periods of development. There is a, I don't like to enter to the old, uh, histories, but remarkable are two persons. These are later by artists created pictures. Herophilos. Now, 2,300 years ago, he was born just here in this area, in Asiatic part of Istanbul, Üsküdar. Then he went to the new founded city Alexandria, 
in Egypt, the Alexander, Alexander Great created many cities in Near East and even in Central Asia. And one of the most productive city and center was the Alexandria in Egypt. Herophilos and then another Greek scientist, Erasistratos, they worked together and it, they have been fortunate also to have the chance to go to the areas where they saw how the expert Egyptian doctors, not doctors, specialists, made mummification of the wealthy deaf people and they saw how the organs are built and they had a chance to observe many anatomic informations. And then they are actually fathers of the modern anatomy. Unfortunately, we don't have any drawings, any publication in our hand. But later on, especially Paulus von Eginata, is another Greek man, he gave in the seventh century full information about all these time periods. So, so we are informed about these people. And I don't like to enter more about this both founder of the anatomy, neuroanatomy. It's a big jump, almost 1,700 years later, from Holland, Dutch, came the Vesalius and interested on medicine and on anatomy. He came to Italy in the Bologna, Padua, Pisa, Venedig, because the Pope was at a lot to make the autopsies. Before it was a forbidden in many cultural centers in the world, but it started. And then he, he was also another pioneer. In the, he died in young age at 50, but he gave an excellent first time books. He could make was, he was very critical towards Galen. Galen was born in the West Anatolia in Bergama. And he was a great medicine pioneer in surgery. He was trained in Izmir, then later he went to Rome was the doctors of the emperors and he made a great contribution but later on we well, he but he studied on the animals and Vesalius made this dissection on human cadaver so he found some 200 error by Galen's anatomy and if I look to the picture of great Vesalius, I can find also some not correct drawings. There are a little mixture. <laughs> Next. Since that time, this is a Renaissance time, there are at least some hundreds of great anatomist. They made a great contribution in, in Europe, later on also in Canada and then in the United States. And I enjoyed very much to found the books of 
Gustav Retius, professor of anatomy in Stockholm, Sweden. He published several monographies about the human brain, the brain of the apes, and then he published also two large volumes about the systemal system. It's, a, it's a unique and very precise information are there. I re would recommend to a young colleague to find in libraries the books from Professor Retius. It's a ba base information are there. Now to come to the vascular organ, which is very special, as I said at the beginning, the differentiation between arteries, capillaries, and veins. We know now together as clear knowledge. The interpretation of systemic cardiopulmonary and distinct central nervous system hemodynamics clarification of the biology of the blood and lymph organs, elucidation of vasomotoric system, and of the enigmatic blood pressure, even nowadays, required centuries of intense investigation to achieve effective knowledge. The history of medicine presents us an impressive cooperative, but also a controversial evolution of concepts and convictions related to vascular organ and unique functions. This is actually all related to other organs and all other, other con convictions. It is good to have critics. Now, the vascular system in general and the neurovascular system in particular disclose anatomic, embryonic, histologic, genetic, physiologic, pathologic, medical and surgical fascinating aspects. The neurovascular organ evolved into phylogenic, ontogenic, infantile, adult and elder age stages. Stepwise, it is a heteromorphic and heterofunctional open system with a unique capacity to fluctuate and adapt according to focal and regional requirements of blood supplements. If there is a need, new vessels are created. This is unique. I like to recommend to young colleagues also the publication from Marin Padilla. He's a Portuguese originated, but his work working in New York is embryologist. I met him on a meeting, neurosurgeons, and then I enjoyed his presentation about the development of the brain vessels. I was very impressed and I asked him, please give a chapter for us. So in the volume 3B about the AVMs, he gave, no, sorry, in 3, 3A, he gave an excellent chapter how the meninges, the brain tissue in the vessel developed at the same time in cooperation and then we had to find out this super architecture, a unique architecture and we'll, I will tell you a little more later. Here we have, before I started the arteries I'd like to show here, the venous system is the much important also because it has enormous richdom 
there are more veins in the brain than in other organs. And this is now well examined, but we are thankful to the publication of one Chinese colleague from Shanghai, as I remember, Yung Peng Huang. He was from Shanghai and then he went then via Kyoto to the United States in Mount Sinai. He was involved in neuroradiology and remained in neuroradiology, but he gave us the best information about the anatomy and also embryologic, the development of the venous system in the brain. Here we have him here on the nice picture. In development, interestingly, since Vesalius, we have another Dutch scientist, Friedrich Roche. He had the idea to inject into the vessel wax with color and then macerate the tissue. As you can see, he succeeded some <laughs> 300 years ago. Such a perfect architecture of the vessels, unique. 300 years before. He was invited for many centers in Europe and showed this, his, his work. And this was stimulating. Another thing I like to show you, this impressed me. Visiting a neurosurgical meeting in Florence some years ago, we had a chance to visit the, the Museum La Specula. In this museum, you can see here, this is a model, it looks like a living person. And everything is miniaturely, precisely prepared from wax. And this is a Clemente Suzuki. And it is an old tradition in Italy. They started also before, but in anatomy, they, they, Suzini was the master, was helped by great scientists and anatomist Fontana. And they created incredible number, 2,000 each organs in detail. I was so impressed to see how the brain arteries can be seen here, you see the, on the on neck, the carotid arteries, and then in brain is built, and also in the spine. 2,000 preparates are there, and if you are, you have a chance to go, or maybe the Chinese companies will visit this museum and make some picture and give such educative lecture, like this lecture now here. It's, at that time, there was a no X-ray, no photo, no movies, no videos, nothing. These wax figures have been very important. So it was also made another series in France for Montpellier University and then Vienna, and one was in the, in the New Orleans in the USA. And this is from wax, it's well kept, not destroyed. Now, this was time period until 1895. It was not possible before, just 60 years before it started with the photography, first steps. And then Röntgen, German physicist, discovered X-rays 
they can go through the tissue and see them inside our body, the structure, the bones, and later on other organs. This was made by him, by the person. You see the entire body skeleton on living person. This is the new area, the visualization area, first step. 1895. And here is the Professor Harvey Cushing in John Hopkins Hospital. He was also a genial person and he's the founder of he was general surgeon, but he was more interested in the neurosurgery and was separating neurosurgery. And he used also, one year later, after the discovery of X-ray, he got a patient, was shot from backside with pistol. And the project, project, project was, was in the cervical spine. He, he operated this female and helped her on, on, but on X-ray, they could see very well where is the projectile. And this was also introduction of the X-ray in the neurosurgery. And we see here many gentlemen, just few. Their, their Guggenheim, sorry, the Oppenheim is in Berlin, is a neurologist. He supported very much Professor Krause. And Professor Schiller is uh, in Vienna. He's, he's a radiologist, a radiologist. He wrote an excellent books about the bones in our head and the, the differences, etc. Fantastic book. He was a pioneer. And the next man is the doctor, Professor Walter Dandy, co-worker with Professor Harvey Cushing in Johns Hopkins. He came to the idea to give in the ventricular system in the brain air, because he saw by ruptured intestines, the air was in the abdomen. So he, get, he got the idea. So we had a ventriculography since 1918. And then we have the Lee's home, he developed better X-ray operates. And then we have the Chicago French radiologist. He made the spine and myelography techniques and here, two Portuguese experts. We have here Professor Moniz, neurologist. He got Nobel Prize for these discoveries. And what not for what he made it. He made it first in dogs angiographies and later on human. But he was not the <coughs> surgeon. Here is Dalima, Portuguese neurosurgeon. He was the man who made the angiograms. And they introduced the cerebral angiography. I forget one picture. Sorry. It's I did like to show the first pictures of our I, we are missing. The first picture of brain tumors and uh, brain vascular malformation came 1934 around. And published by Moniz and Dalima in Dot in Edinburgh in Scotland. I came to neurosurgery on January 1953. 
And Dr. Crimebill is a very excellently trained neurosurgeon in England, in Oxford, in London. He came 1936 to Zurich and founded neurosurgery in Switzerland. He was a very disciplined person in his thinking and working in how he was a meticulous and carefully surgeon. I spent with him 40 years. He was interested what I made it in my training and I told him I learned a little neuroanatomy dissection. He said, good, then you should now try to do something different. Can you puncture the carotid artery and vertebral artery through the skin? I said, I will try. And next day I we started, and I was, you see here on picture, I didn't ask for this picture on the background is a nurse. The sister of this nurse did like to have the picture from her. <laughs> now she, she was behind the apparatus. We had a installation behind, behind this X-ray apparatus and what is this? What is that? What is the what is it? Who is the arrow? Oh here. Here behind. So there was a six X ray films. The, she had to pull out the cassette. I punctured the artery with a needle and then injected. By injection immediately I said, go, 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 go in five to six seconds, she pull out six films. So this is the time in adults where the blood flow runs. And in children, maybe four seconds. We made a serial angiography and also we had a here very unusual operate. We could yeah, we made a, a first series, and for the second series, we changed the axis of the X-ray camera five degree, and whether horizontal or or vertical. And then we got a stereo picture. In the picture, we could put left side and right side. In the middle is a mirror, and you can adjust the mirror axis and then you related your own eye positions and you could see the vessels like you are sitting in the brain. We saw the arteries at the beginning, then full, and then the capillaries, then we saw the venous, and then full draining system. Three-dimensional, from right on or from the left, from front, from the back side. So it was a perfect orientation. And we, I, our experiences, I made a almost 12 year angiographies. At that time, there was a no computer tomography, no MRI. So for first was an electroencephalography made and on the, related to the symptom on AAG was made a one-sided angiography or both sides or four vessel angiography. All together some 9,000 angiograms were made and put it in these two publications. This is a blue one is the vertebral basilar system and then the green one is the carotid system. My interest was mainly to study the variation, individual variation of the arteries and the veins. You see here, 
if you, we could sit here in front and move the mirror system forwards or backwards or also a little move around, it was a perfect situation. I did like to present in this book also three-dimensional pictures, but the company said this would be very expensive. So we, unfortunately, we, we didn't, we couldn't make it. Now, being interested to, of this cerebral angiography, I studied also the special anatomy of the arteries and discovered there are some 10, 12 different segments which are in architecture a little different in, and also there are vessels, veins around the arteries, and, but intracranial there are not close to the arteries. So involved on this special anatomy, we found the brain arteries are different. They have a different outer layer, adventitia, less collagen fibers, lamina externa doesn't exist, media muscle is also gradually getting small, smaller, then nerve innervation is reduced, and vascular activity also, vasomotor activity reduced, endothelial regional change, and then very important is vasa vasorum, vasa is vasa vasorum. Like the coronary arteries, vasa vasorum helps for the metabolism on the arteries, on body, but in the brain, they can help on the outer layer, outer to one third. And from inside, it's coming from the lumen, from inside. In the brain has no vasa vasorum. And a lymph vessel was called missing, but the new d d discoveries show they have a very fine, very fine lymph vessel around the brain vessels. In studying the brain arteries, it was clear the brain arteries are not end arteries, not end branches like a you know, tree. At the end they come together, they get smaller, 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 but they get con connected from one hemisphere. They, they, they have a very special connection system. And we have a four main arteries bringing per minute five to six hundred cubic blood to the brain, four, four vessel, carotid and vertebral. And then there are also connections to the spinal arteries. So we may have a occluded vessel in one artery or two, still the patient may have no symptom or three arteries, no symptom. When four arteries can get occluded, it still the patient has no problems because the collaterals from spinal arteries goes to the brain. And Professor Kikuchi, who was trained with us in Zurich, he dis discovered, uh, visualized in one, two patients in Kyoto, such a situation, four vessels occluded, spinal collaterals. But it is not so simple. We may have survived with occlusion of one or two or three vessels, but sometimes one artery narrowing, stenosis, or one branch of an artery make problems because the collateral system doesn't work. In children, it is said they work better, partially. So for the young colleague 
please think on this. We still don't understand the function of this brain arteries. They have a collateral, but the function is not secured. For some reason, it's well, partially well studied, but still not well proved what's going on. So this is very important for us, in which cases of an occluded vessel we need to help. Here is a, another picture of a brain arteries on here red. We may have a occlusion in one artery, okay, but there is a one connection here, you see, main connection. So it can be helped from the other side. But there are small arteries here. They are some way end arteries. If one of these arteries close, then it's a big trouble because they vascularize support deep center of the brain. And then it can be very negative for the patient. Now, we started to study this system and found also for the young colleague, they should realize, we may have a vessel, not only two, three. And the, in the middle, the third, anterior cerebral artery can be dominant in, in vascularizing both hemispheres. So any problem to this main artery can be very sequential. Big problem may arise. Now, as I said, the phylogeny I couldn't find in properly pu publication about the phylogenetic development. But in ontogeny, there is an excellent publication. We see in, in the person within nine months how the vessel system change and find final condition like here, here, as you know. And then here, the development of the arterial system and venous system. You, there is in each book, these pictures are presented. And it is originally, originally made by an artist. I like to show her. This lady, her father was a teacher, and she had a talent as a child, talent to drawing. And the father sent her to New York to be an artist. But she discovered differences. And so I like to tell, she made 1948 an excellent monography about the embryology. In this book, this picture, what you saw from arteries and veins, she made herself. Great artist. But unfortunately, she died very early on a can cancer. Now, she started in New York with an art school, but changed immediately to Johns Hopkins Hospital, to the center. This is the artist center. And one German artist from Leipzig was taken from the anatomy and gynecology professors to Johns Hopkins, Max Brödel, he made this center, as you can see here on the right side, 
the artist, he, he trained almost 400 young people as artists. Left side, where the neurosurgeons were trained in this laboratory. And Max Bredel also trained Cushing. Cushing, Cushing was talented to drawing. So the old publication from Cushing and from, from Dandy are excellent or from other uh, uh, discipline. They made an excellent contribution, Max Bredel and then this lady what, which I showed you. And here is the Max Bredel in elder age. And he said the learning experience would be incomplete without self-investigation. The artist must know that his subject so truly that he can shut his eyes and coax into existence a mental picture, a great clarity, complete in every respect. This means, as you saw on the right, right down, the pictures are not just photos. They are animated pictures. You see, the photo on the film and all the MRI and all, is all fixed. The artist, we need the artist because the artist add from his memory and his imagination, his experiences, informations. So we have an animated picture and these are very essential. And this was the Max Breder school. I was planning to come to, back to Turkey 1960 around and then my teacher and chairman, Professor Krambi said, no, we have to publish first and the, you have to work on this book. And then 1962, we get a, a cardiovascular surgeon, Professor Ake Senning from Stockholm. He was an engineer also, and he started in Zurich open heart surgery on children, he repaired the valves, heart valves, and very few cases happen. And in this case here, you what to see, the arrow is so small, and I have trouble to show immediately, but Mr. Ali had showed you. A 17 year old young lady, by awakening, oh, after heart surgery, she didn't move the right side and she couldn't speak. And then I made the angiography and saw here one artery, so-called cent central sulcus artery. And it's very responsible for the pre and postcentral gyri, important for the movement and for the sensory. And I showed Professor Senning and said, there is here an occlusion. He got very upset and said, oh, you should go and operate this immediately. And my answer was, yes, sir, but we don't, I have no experience to do this. And, and then I can not imagine we don't have that much small needles and suture material. We have to learn. Thank his insistence, I had to go to learn somewhere microvascular surgery. And it took a while until we found a proper center because they didn't exist. Finally, we found in Burlington, Vermont. Now, on the microscope. I'd like to show just important information. 
one another Dutch businessman, successful businessman, he had an interest on science, on nature, on biology, and he developed himself a special microscope. Imagine in the 17th century, he made it, he melted the glass, in the drop of glass, they have been like the lenses. So he created lenses, magnifying 100 times, 200 times, 400 times. So he could see the red cells. He saw first time brain cells. He saw the spermian. So he was a great discoverer man. But interesting, another point. This Italian technician, Giuseppe Campani, in the 17th century, he created this micro microscope but it, was, it could be used also as a telescope. And then you could see here, he is trying to op help to see the wound on an injured leg. And the nurse give the <laughs> light by candlelight. And this was, imagine, it took another 300 years before really an operating microscope was created. It is a, the society must get ripe on demanding and this few, for few cases, the, the industry cannot produce. And so the discovery remain unrealized. Here, I came in 1965 in October to Burlington, Vermont. On the background, you see Professor Danahy. He was interested to do vascular surgery and working on, on rabbits' femoral arteries. And here is the head nurse, scrub nurse, Jackie her surname. Professor Danny had time one morning, three hours to show me how he, we can work. But my teacher was this lady, Mrs. Rogers. She was patientful and very strong teacher. And she observed all what I am doing there. And we started first by a rubber tube. Later we started with the rats and then rabbits and then later on dogs. And I worked two, year, two months on uh, extremities. Then I did like to work on brain art of the, sorry. Another remark. The brain, not brain arteries, the vessel surgery was started in the 18th century, 19th century laboratories. And here is Professor Alex Karel from Lyon in France. He went to first to Canada, Montreal, then went short time later to St. Louis in work with Professor Guthrie. He was a Chicago physiology professor. He had a good laboratory. So he learned by him the first steps of the vascular surgery. And he's a genial person, and he had ideas to do also more and more and more. And he made an organ transplantation. 
on animals successfully. So this it started actually by Professor Karel Guthrie. Professor Karel became the Nobel Prize and his principle was to have this three point fixation and then repair with some 10, 12 suture. We, I never used this because I put inside a, a soft tube and then the last moment I removed. I will show you later. Here is our, here are the pennies, Dr. Danahi. With Dr. Danahi was working Dr. Julius Jacobson. He was cardiovascular surgeon from New York, appointed to Burlington, and had a, for a pharma com company, he should study what happened if the carotid arteries ligated, etc., and then sutured again. His assistant from Argentine, Dr. Suarez, saw in corridor in laboratory size microscope. Said, sir, can we use the microscope? He said, okay, we do this. And then I will show you what he made it. So it started repair of the vessels on the microscope. They came down to two millimeters. And here is Dr. Harry Banke. I visited 1966 some 10-12 centers in the United States, mostly plastic surgeon, cosmetic surgeon, vascular surgeon, and they have been interested to make a precise anastomosis. And Dr. Banke showed me one monkey and said, you see on this animal, I made a transplantation between thumb and big toe. And it works, and this is important. It was, I was very impressed from his work, it was very precise. But we lost him, unfortunately, on a car accident, not by mot moto motorcycle accident. Now, this is the preparate, what you see here, on the upstairs, the uh, uh, upper corner. End-to-end -end anastomosis made without microscope. Here with the microscope. This was given to me by Dr. Jacobson in, in April 1966. I like it. I started to do brain artery surgery. I insisted saying, Dr. Danny, sir, I have to, to do some help for the cardiovascular surgeon in Zurich. So we started to operate first on the basilar artery. Approach was transcervical, transclival, and a small opening. And I made a, even on this case a patch. We I took this artery is uh, some two minutes, uh, oh, one and a half millimeter. And at that time, we didn't have a fine needle and then suture material. And you see here, it worked well. And then I like to show this dog. This was a dog. He survived very well. It's interesting, as I met him first day, he was barking. But later he got a good friend. I walked with him every day around the laboratory. <laughs> now, here is the first case. 
you see the brain artery in one millimeter. It is smaller than one millimeter. The point is, the artery is not on the surface, on the surface, but covered by arachnoid and arachnoidal fiber system, like a spider network around the arteries are very fine fiber systems. So just one centimeter opening of this segment needs real time on patient. You see, I made it well, you see the, the gyral area seems normal now, and I made a patch. This worked. And, and, then, and then I said, Dr. Dani, sir, the new area neurosurgery should start. And you see here end-to-end -end anastomosis, and here is a, a graft, double, just exercise. And here, extra intracranial bypass on, on a dog. This was possible thanks to bipolar coagulation te technique of Dr. Dan, uh, Malis. Leonard Malis was uh, in Montana Hospital and a very close friend of. Yung Peng Huang, and he developed this apparate bipolar coagulator, so we could make a just a small point bipolar coagulation. I used at the beginning forceps for watchmakers. They they are six different sizes. Zero to five by five is the end is like a needle. So you can make a, just one tenth of a millimeter small coagulation. So we could keep the area very clean. Unfortunately, also we've lost Len Mullis early, and this was a great help. Microscope and bipolar coagulation, and we developed. Later, you see the series, almost 30 different lengths and tip size. You can make it much more, maybe better. Oh, okay, because we are working on brain on surface, but we go through the cisterns down, sometimes 10, 12 centimeter in depth. So we, we need special length. Now, 1953, there was a, a revolution in the optic system. Dr. Littmann succeeded to produce this OPMI-1 microscope with electricity. It, it, you could move, and this was good. But we found we need in neurosurgery much higher mobility, and we develop counterbalance system and with electronic con control, with the brake system to, to stabilize and to move. And you see me here sitting on a hydraulic chair and also armrest. It is very important to have forearm and hands stabilized because 10 minutes you can stay in the air but two three hours you will start to have a tremor so this hydraulic armrest is also mobile but can you move 360 degree around is a very essential and the microscope is now advantage between ocular and objective short and it was a problem of a heating 
because the ocular get after a while foggy. So we started put cable and make a heating. Light, light heating. And then here the mouthpiece, if I push here, it released the brake and I could move with my mouth whole microscope because if there's a 30, 30, 40 kilogram counterbalance, it is easy like a feather if it's a good balance. And now, we discovered later that the astronome for the telescope use also a heating system like this. I put here the name of the company. And we needed also temporary clips to stop the blood flow in the arteries. Just a few minutes. And originally we created, we made it just four or five clips, but later they created 180 such a clips in length and fine, and we, we made also one very small, very small vessels. Now, another essential part is for the microsurgery is to have this cotton patties. They can be very small or large. They keep the area clean, and I will sh tell why. Later, I will show you. Here, 1967, in January, I came back to Zurich. And then, <clears throat> we waited for a while until a case came with a good indication for surgery. A young man, 27 year old, not smoker, and healthy, but he get a acute stroke, but temporary. He was full recovered as, as he came. And I said, look, you have the inferior branch of the middle cerebral artery is occluded. You may have more trouble. He accepted, and we see here yellow, sclerotic part of the artery, of the inferior trunk. And then I open it and then made some 20 single seizure. It was well opened, you can see angiographically. How come this sclerosis occurred in a 27 year old person? He's not smoker. We all react as tobacco make but there are other genetical factors we don't know what. This was the beginning. Now, this surgery was made also by other surgeons, neurosurgeons. I put the name here. And without microscope. But the point is, these arteries are in the fissure and in the salt sea and they are covered by arachnoidal fibers and the membrane. We can open the membrane easy, but the arachnoids are so small, like the small vessels. It's better to do it under microscope. None. The point is here. These operations on patients with occlusive intracranial vascular disease have been approached with great apprehension and hesitation because the indication for operation in such cases has not been delineated. Now we are in September 2020. Still, we don't have any clear method to show us whether this person has now the symptoms and improved, whether he will get again, 
when and whether light again on a small stroke or big stroke, it is unclear. We have no method to control the function of the collateral system. In individual case, there is a no precise method to determine whether spontaneous recovery or repeated attacks with progression of the disease will occur. So, I operated altogether on the seven patients with middle cerebral artery. And then, Professor Fisher in Boston is a neurologist. He was very interested on problem of the blood circulation of brain and stroke problem. He said, it is even convincible that someday vascular surgery will find the will bypass the occluded portion of the artery during the period of ominous fleeting system symptom. Anastomosis of the external carotid artery of no, n note of its branches with the internal carotid artery above the area of the narrowing should be possible. Non, I, I, sorry, I couldn't read well, but he declared clearly once a day it could, should be made a bypass. And this was made. Waringer, neurosurgeon in Colmar, French, and Kudlin, vascular surgeon in Paris, came together on May the 1st, anastomosis 1962, around anastomosis between external carotid and intracranial carotid, a complicated way. It was very successful performed, but the patient get a pneumonia and died. So this, this, this was unfortunate. Now, in 1967, October, one patient came with symptoms. He was at that time 57 year old gentleman, engineer. He said, if he turned his head to the left side, he get a weakness on the right side and fell down. And I made him, myself, my, uh, the angiography. As you can see, the right internal carotid occluded, left also occluded, and the right vert vertebral I couldn't puncture, but the left side, you see, from the left vertebral entire brain is filled. There are also other collateral for the brain circulation and transorbital or from backside from occipital artery, but this is the main way. So this was the situation of this gentleman, three arteries occluded, only the left one open. And then we see also sometime only a segment of carotid artery can be occluded and hinders the collateral system working. Sorry. I said to this gentleman, I know that now technique I could help you making an extra intracranial bypass. He was enthusiastic. He said, oh, okay, we do. And we made it. And you see here is on the surface of the right temporal area, an artery. And you see, here is the artery, and then here is the superficial temporal artery. And then we made anastomosis, it was working. And you see the collateral. 
this was the first case on a human case. It, it works, bypass. You see this gentleman here, he's standing also on his left leg. Now, short after, it came critical remarks. They made a studies, the negative results of this study no longer allow us to believe that bypass surgery is an uh, instrument of consequence in the prevention of the stroke. Ah, I didn't react it immediately because the point was correct. Some colleague they visited us in Zurich on one day or one week or the one month or the one year, but some of them they started to do this bypass routinely, just for business reason, and they made a many 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 and this the insurance companies get ner nervous about this situation and they asked for this result and now the point is I will come back to this point forget the now the <coughs> occluded arteries but we have situation like in this lady's case she was at that time 18 year old had a, no bleeding from this giant aneurysm of the internal carotid bifurcation but she began to develop a left side weak weakness. I offered her, we can see whether we can put a clip, but it was a very large base, and I put the, when I get it, the internal carotid artery, distal to the anterior carotid artery, and made an extra intracranial bypass. She's still alive, this was 1968, and she's doing well, she's married, had children. So this is one possibility and it can be used by aneurysm and by tumors. And then this disease, this is discovered by a Japanese colleague in 1957 called Moya Moya disease and interesting here the vertebral artery filling not only the cerebellar and cerebral also in the encephalic area enormous micro arterial system increased one and in this case, Professor Ture had both sides anastomos made it. And, and you can see it, it is both sides made and very well. And the, this congestion of the microarterial disappeared. This phenomenon I don't understand. What type of a micro collaterals are there? This is not well clear. Now, <clears throat> this can happen to the children. This can happen also to the adult person. And it's happened 1972. We get a, a family coming from Belgium with a six-year-old boy. He had uh, some mental problems and then they some seizure type and we found he has moya moya disease, bilateral carotid. In my knowledge, bilateral vertebral, I never saw it. So I made this 1972 and Dr. Kreinbild published this 95. This is for the colleagues' information. This was the first case, Moya Moya, 
bypass extra intracranial because it is very difficult. The vessels are so much smaller and need more patience. Now, coming back, the point is here academic. We are <coughs> mixing two clinical conditions. One is the full stroke, ischem ischemic stroke. The population notice either <coughs> on the arm or arm and leg, and also speech trouble or completely lost. Or they can be only short symptoms, problem with the eye, or some weakness a little, short time. We call this temporary ischemic attack. In these cases, if the angiography show some occluded segments, one, two, or three, we need bypass. But <clears throat> if there is a full stroke and hemiplegia, aphasia, and the CT and MRI show us infarct with, without hemorrhage, first infarct, later they make heavy bleeding. So the stroke is another disease. The circulation problem is different. And this was interesting to tell you here, 1628, William Harvey, English scientist, he visited and learned in Italy. He got the information about the vessel system and he, he first time presented the blood circulation of body. And this was also published in a book, monography, 1964. There were pictures from great English architect Wren. So this is now well known as Circle of Willis. So connection between the both in anterior cerebral and the posterior cerebral to the carotid system. And then Malpighi also discovered the capillary system. So it was complete knowledge. But it is some way forgotten one Swiss physician, Weffer, in Basel studied, he wrote 1650, 85, a voluminous book I had in my hand from the library in Basel. And he described in this book precisely the circle of Willis, but there is no single picture. So <laughs> we should mention him also correctly. Here is a Willis and the picture of Wren, then later on drawing how we. Now the discussion. You see, <coughs> this picture is made in Kenya, Nairobi. There was a surgeon who was trained by Dr. Uh, Senning in Zurich, heart surgeon. Then he returned home and he discovered this case 
you can see in internal carotid artery is stenotic before bifurcation and poor branches. But the nature created from extracranial occipital artery a connection to the cortical artery. So the nature made actually the first extra intracranial bypass. I never saw such a case, but Professor Ture told me he saw some cases. I don't remember. Now, another question arises, if the brain needs blood, we need also a better <coughs> extra intracranial bypass. You can take a saphenous vein, or you can take a, an artery and make a free transplantation and connect to the carotid artery. This is not my opinion. I tried to do this on dogs, it didn't work. And I said, superficial temporal artery is one and a half to two millimeter size, but if the brain needs blood, it will get larger. And this is the case. This extracranial arterial system is a good supplier for the brain circulation. I published in 1968 this microvascular surgery. This is not a new edition. If the colleague would like to see a little more detailed information about the bypass technique, you can, we will find there. Then later on, I published this second book after I had some three, four year experiences in surgery. Here are the T-tubes. And then this is a company, unfortunately, it's closed. Taken that. There are very small, less than one millimeter tubes, or for the carotid artery, larger tubes. We can cut the ends a little shorter, and you don't have to put that much in, in entire length. So, <clears throat> because the blood circulation should not be interrupted. Even if this only a few minutes, five to 10 minutes, if you put such a tube, you can work in half an hour or one hour quietly, properly. Now, one more. I like to describe I, I operated only few cases carotid arteries because they have been operated in the general surgery. And so they, they went well, what, what I made it. But here I like to show this publication in European Journal of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery. You can copy here is an excellent summary of what was made in laboratories and later in human, if you like to read it. And then there is another publication here from Journal of Vascular Surgery, 2014, from Friedman, about the topic where who made the first carotid end arterotomy. And interesting, they made the inter first ligature and then end-to-end -end anastomosis to the, from, from the external or from direct internal to in internal. And Debecki made a just incision and remove the sclerotic part and make the suture. So there is a discussion now who was the first 
first was he made it in in, in Correa in, in Argentine. Yeah, you can read this in this publication. I hope I gave a, a little information for the young colleagues where we are in still in big problem. Still, we don't have a very proper method to measure the brain capacities, especially hemodynamic capacities, whether it will recover itself or is a big danger is there. And this is the main problem. Surgical technique is there. We can go down even to half millimeter size. But the problem is a good indication. I heard from Professor Hernes Nemi, one Chinese neurosurgeon made already 7,000 extra intracranial bypass. I, I like to read the results, how it looks, and what indication was given, etc. Would be very interesting. Hi, you are. Good luck for your work. Bye bye. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Professor Yasakil. That was a great lecture, long from the history coming to the present state. And the Chinese neurosurgeon is here with the more than 7,000 bypasses. So I think uh, you had some short lecture on the present state of the bypasses. Subin, is it right? It's going well, you uh, <coughs> the picture. Yeah, I don't well. In the beginning, some difficulties, but uh, maybe no. it was here. Here, the connection was not good. No, the the, the picture is perfect. Yeah, good. So, do you, you had to some short presentation, Subin? Okay, there we go. Okay. Here, let's make sure the sounds okay. Sound is okay. Everything's okay. Okay, there's no audio uh, bin. You may have to reload it and put the audio on. Exactly, it's on the screen share. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Now, now you can hear me. Okay, now I can hear you now. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Yuha and uh, uh, Professor Yasajian uh, for the uh, great presentation. So today I will uh, presented my uh, latest case. Uh, it's a minimally invasive target bypass surgery guided by three dimension DSA. So I come from Hwasan uh, Hospital. Uh, we have, uh, our department is a huge department uh, around 800 beds and uh, 40 operating rooms. And we are the uh, ACNS and the WFS uh, training center. So this is my personal experience in bypass. Uh, last year, I have 1,039 cases. So totally, I have took uh, more than 7,000 cases uh, in 110 hospitals in China and India. So my personal record is five minutes and 40 seconds to finish a stoma. So this is uh, my latest case. Uh, uh, it's a female patient. You can see uh, she suffered from uh, episode, uh, episodic weakness in right limbs for five months. The DS, you can see uh, some uh, uh, small infection on the uh, left hemisphere. So this is uh, uh, the angiogram. 
So uh, this is our surgical plan, uh, selecting the donor and the recipient artery, uh, use three dimension DSA. So we measure the, uh, measuring the distance between donor and the recipient artery from the uh, three dimension reconstructed uh, uh, DSA. So you can see the AP view, the distance between the donor and the recipient artery is around uh, 9.8 millimeter. From the lateral view, it's only uh, 2.3 millimeter. So then we calculating the length of the skin incision and the diameter of the bone flap we needed to perform the uh, bypass. So uh, we select two landmarks uh, on the uh, EC, uh, ECA angiogram uh, between the two small bifurcation of the uh, STA. And uh, we select the bone flap uh, around the uh, two millimeter, uh, two, two centimeter diameter. So uh, this is a, a segment of STA we selected uh, between the two bifurcation. So this is a two bifurcation is a landmarks in, in surgery to remind, uh, to remind us uh, which segment is, is. So the length of the uh, dissected uh, uh, STA is around 14 millimeter. So this is a, a targeted uh, recipient artery. Uh, we measured from the uh, three dimension DSA, it's around uh, 14 uh, millimeter. So uh, if you add the uh, distance uh, of the temporal clips, uh, normally it uh, need at least uh, the diameter of the bone flap, uh, it's around two centimeter. So this is our surgical plan. Uh, uh, use the uh, rear uh, surgical uh, angle and uh, position. So this is a rear surgical view. We, we can see uh, the three dimension DSA should exactly uh, same uh, anatomy of the vessel uh, as the rear surgical view. So this is a video in the operation. So the skin incision is uh, four centimeter and this is uh, dissecting the, uh, I use a cut down technique to harvest the STA. Use the monopolo to dissect it. It's a uh, very fast and uh, safe. The small bone, uh, bone flap is around the uh, two centimeter. So then uh, after ligated the distal end of the STA, we cut it and the trim the uh, one end of the STA. So then Cut the arachnoid membrane, then temporal clip of the recipient artery. So here you, you see the another recipient artery, but it's uh, too thin and uh, too small. So we select the uh, more deeper one. It's uh, uh, more thicker and larger. But uh, the problem is uh, it's quite deep. So use the two temporal clips to stop the blood flow. You can see the intra uh, the the intra uh, artery pressure is quite low, so it's uh, quite uh, pink, but not red. So may, then make this. 
cut off one piece of the basal wall, an oval shape, then make the anastomose, So it's quite fast. Then another side. Then remove the distal temporal clip. You can see the stoma is quite deep. Uh, it's all in the CSF. So then remove the uh, temporal clip of STA. Now you can see the stoma. And uh, this is a uh, ICG show the good patency of the stoma. So you can see this is the incision of the uh, scalp. It's around the four centimeter. So this is the size of the uh, bone flap. You can see it's uh, smaller than two uh, centimeter. So this is uh, after the surgery, we, uh, you can see the uh, very small hole. Uh, actually, it's a keyhole approach. So now the patient recovered very well. So this is an uh, incision and uh, we kept uh, the hair of the patient. Okay, thank you. It's a short presentation for a case. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Supin. Mm -hmm. It looked very nice, technique. You, do you think that you turn in all cases that way? You will do more and more? Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, sure. Opening. Yeah, I will do, uh, I will try uh, this new technique again. That looks good. Mm -hmm. Some is there co questions, comments? Okay, go Hello, ahead, sir. Go ahead. Hello, Dr. Yuha. Hello, Victor. This Hello, was Victor. Uh, these lectures uh, were very, very impressive and unforgettable. It's uh, impressive to look. Uh, the master of neurosurgery as Yasser Hill, and also you, Professor Yuha. Thanks a lot to bring us these wonderful lectures. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great pleasure. Okay, more comments? Mm. Now I'd just like to say thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Chagla from Bombay. Yeah, just like to say thank you to Professor Yashagil 
as well as you have. It's, it's wonderful to see this kind of work uh, in this horrible times. And we're grateful that we could come together and share some of this. Fantastic. And uh, this is the way forward, micro neurosurgery. It's the cheapest for countries like China and India, for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Go ahead. Go ahead. Dr. Harshad Parikh from Bombay again. Hi, Dr. Professor. Hello. As always, you arrange some great webinars. I have been attending your webinars regularly. And today, when I saw Professor Yasser Gil delivering a lecture, we were in a journey to a history of neurosurgery and the vascular surgery. It is one of the most amazing lectures which we have seen and heard. Thank you very much for arranging such lecture. It is very enlightening and wonderful. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Thank you very much for your kind words. Yeah, thank you. Um, ben, we have a question from a panelist. Uh, uh, okay. Of all those cases, how many did you make an extracranial, intracranial bypass? What? Okay. ECIC bypass? Yeah, I don't know if I understand the question. Uh, perhaps. Uh, we told more than 7,000. Uh, yes. Okay. okay. More than 7,000 should be experienced. Yes. World record. Not to be beaten. Okay. <laughs> you better start early. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, more comments, questions? Now's your chance. Don't be shy. Let me see here. Okay. You know, I'm not a neurosurgeon, uh, Yuha and Ben, but, but Dr. Yazagor, he's a history of microneurosurgery. He is the history of microneurosurgery, right? Right. Yeah, he's the founder and founder of microneurosurgery. Actually, he developed everything: the microscope and and instruments and techniques. So this is everything is in a package. So he developed everything hectically after returning from USA, from mm -hmm. Burlington. So he developed everything in the coming years, and uh, so in five years after returning from USA, it was. Everything was done. Balanced microscope and uh, many instruments and clips for anal surgery. So then all the world went to Zurich. More than 3,000 researchers came during his time and uh, then went home and spread the message of micro surgery. So actually, all the 50,000 researchers around the world, they are students of Professor Yazaki. Very good. Very good. Oh, there's a question here. Let me see if I can get to it. Um, let's see here. Do you gentlemen see any questions there in the panel? I, I'm missing one, no. I think. I think I'm missing one here. Uh, okay, if you have any questions, uh, you could ask directly or you can put it in the panel. Okay, I'm trying to catch the questions in the panelists. Oh, here's one from Yasmin Lamus. Do you prefer STA over external carotid? Does that make sense? Do you mean the STA bypass uh, yeah, instead yeah. of uh, ECA, radio artery, or saphenous vein uh, high flow bypass? I believe Yasmin means yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, just as uh, professor, uh, professor Yasagi uh, mentioned, that uh, uh, if you do the double bypass of STA to MCA, normally it can feed the whole MCA territory. Yeah, if the 
patient uh, STA diameter is la larger than 1.5 uh, millimeter, normally uh, it's enough to replace the MCA territory. And if you use some progressive clip, uh, if the uh, uh, brain have some demand for the blood flow, it, uh, the STA can uh, expand it uh, a lot. And uh, uh, according to our uh, research, uh, the, S, uh, the double STA MCA can uh, supply more than 150 uh, millimeter per minute. Uh, this kind of uh, blood volume, uh, it's equal to a high flow bypass. So sometimes uh, we, you, you can use uh, this kind of uh, double bypass, STA, MCA. But uh, sometimes if, the, if we want to replace the blood flow of ICA, it's especially the dominant site, like, uh, I mean, the, the ICA not only feeded the uh, same hemisphere, but also the contralateral ACA territory. So this kind of uh, condition we want to replace the ICA's uh, blood flow, uh, we need the high flow bypass, uh, especially the subcutaneous main by high flow bypass. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. We have a question actually for Dr. Yazergill, but he's not here. Maybe Yuha could answer it. Uh, uh, Pablo Villanueva says it would be very interesting to know uh, Dr. Yazergill's opinion about endovascular treatments, and Yuha probably knows that, correct? Uh, it would be very interesting to know. Maybe next year, if we can travel, we can go to Istanbul when there is the Ugurturas two weeks course, life course, and professor is certainly there. We can ask there. So okay. I, I think uh, he will have a very complex answer. Okay. Okay, more comments or but questions? I don't know if we can travel. It, it doesn't look so good now, the situation. Oh, well, we can go to Turkey. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is this is what I mean to Istanbul. Yeah. Professor Bean, good morning. Hey Lewis. Hi, good morning. One uh, technical question. Where uh -huh. where you where is the vessel you prefer to perform the bypass? Precentral or post central? And if you have difference with different anatomy anatomy pattern of the patient, because you, you know some patient have the different pattern anatomy of the middle cerebral artery bifurcation and where you decide to choose the M3 vessel is precentral, port central, is dependent anatomy. Where is your, your election, your management, please? Thank you. Okay, the donor artery actually uh, mostly uh, for the uh, it's from the scalp uh, arteries. Uh, anteriorly, we have some uh, frontal branch of STA. Uh, in the middle, uh, it's a parietal branch of STA. Sometimes we have a post auricular artery can substitute the uh, the parietal branch of STA. On the posterior side, we have some uh, occipital artery. So for the scalp, uh, we have this kind of uh, uh, feeders. And for the recipient artery, it depends on the angiogram results. So sometimes if it's a, uh, uh, it's a frontal lobe uh, ischemia, we can use a frontal uh, donor artery. And uh, if it's a, a inferior trunk uh, MCA, we can use a parietal branch of the STA. And uh, if it's a occipital uh, lobe uh, ischemia, we can use the occipital artery. It, it, it depends the ischemic area. Okay, Omar Nadar asks, to what extent one can use the loop in microsurgery rather than the microscope? Oh, I never use the loop uh, because for this kind of uh, uh, anastomos, we need a, a lot of, uh, at least uh, maybe 20 times uh, magnifying. So we use the microscope always. 
I have also never used loops. I have al always taken microscope. Okay. The, I, I think this is unnecessary step to take the loops between. Okay, Danu Rolian asks, this is, a prof uh, this is a question for Professor Zubin. Um, how many hours of practice or specimen anastomosis in the lab needs to be done to master microvascular anastomosis? <laughs> it depends, you know. If you are very, you have very stable hands, uh, maybe two weeks training is enough. Uh, but uh, I heard that uh, some Japanese uh, neurosurgeons, they insist that you have at least 300 uh, anastomos uh, on rat, 300 bypass surgery on rats. Then you can go to the human. But uh, uh, in my experience, uh, it's unnecessary because I have a at least the four assistants, uh, and they, uh, after my first anastomos, I uh, let them do the second uh, anastomos. Normally, they just take longer time, but uh, uh, the the quality is quite fine. Yeah, and then they they can uh, getting uh, faster and faster. Now, like my assistant, uh, Doctor Liao. He can finish the uh, the anastomos around 20 minutes, and uh, now the patency rate is a uh, 100 percent. Yeah. Okay. So he don't he, he don't spend it a lot of time in the laboratory. Okay. Next question, Kuse Al Alaba asks, how do you follow those patients postoperatively? Uh, postoperatively, do you depend on the clinical status of the patient, or do you follow up in geography? I uh, normally we uh, follow up the angiography because you know uh, the Moya Moya case. Most of the Moya Moya cases are bilaterally, so after the uh, first operation, they will come back after six months and we will do the angiogram to uh, follow up the first uh, uh, operations results. And then after the second time, uh, after half a year, they will come back for the second time follow up. Thank you. Martin Ray asks, what kind of antiplatelet therapy you use after an STA MCA bypass performed in a ruptured aneurysm case? No, I never use that. Never use it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, a question from Andrea Brunon, Brunori. Do you believe Ackland approximated useful on the recipient vessels? Does that make sense? Do you see that question? Do you believe Ackland approximator useful in the recipient vessel? Does that make sense, that question? No, Perhaps. I don't. Per, okay, we'll just go on okay. to the next one. Mm -hmm. Lots of questions. Um, the op people are opening up. Okay, Pablo asked another question. What kind and the thickness of suture are you using for the example you show? Any particular technique of where to begin making the suture? Uh, it's a 10-0 uh, protein uh, suture. Uh, uh, okay, Dr. Mammon asks, what is the best area for natural graft and which is better, natural or artificial graft? I only use a natural graft, never use uh, artificial. Okay. Because, you know, this kind of uh, vessel, they are, uh, they are just like a, a live organ. Uh, they can... Uh, they can expansion or uh, they have their own function. So if you, it's an artificial one, actually they couldn't be uh, regulated by the nerve. Okay. Um, and you, you can let me know when I've asked uh, enough questions, okay? Let me ask another question. Uh, what's your opinion on using continuous suture instead of interrupted ones? Will it help to save time? 
Oh, I can uh, answer the question. I only use the uh, interrupted one. Uh, very uh, uh, seldom, uh, if you, you uh, it's a side <coughs> suicide uh, anastomosis. <coughs> On the back side of the uh, anastomosis, uh, we use uh, uh, continuous suturing. But uh, because the uh, stoma can be expanded, uh, just as uh, Yasagir mentioned, uh, we use, we insist to use uh, the interrupted one because according to our follow up, uh, the stoma can, the stoma's uh, diameter can expand it from one millimeter to more than uh, three millimeter. So if you use this uh, continuous suturing, you limited the, the, the expansion of the stoma. Okay, Pablo. Uh... Ask Pablo Villanueva. Ask what opinion do you have of placenta training? This is because many places in my country do not have rats or animals to practice. So, what's your opinion on placenta training? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this is a, a good option for placenta training. Yes. Okay, Yasmin Lamus asks. Professor uh, Ben, uh, do you use heparin intraoperatively, interoperatively, or just antiplatelet after bypass? Yes, I just use heparin to irrigate the surgical field under the intracavity of the donor artery or recipient artery, but not uh, systematically use it. Are you and, using uh, Go ahead. Anti antiplatelet uh, drugs, uh, it depends, you know. Uh, around uh, uh, 10 percent. Uh, if the patient have some uh, TIA uh, preoperative rate, I will use it. But if uh, the patient is quite stable, I never use. Uh, I don't use anti platelet drugs after bypass. Okay, Dr. Mamon asks: Are you are you using heparin or warfarin, and for how long do you close the vessels? I already. <laughs> I'm sorry, oh, already, I'm sorry did I, I didn't ask yeah, the same yeah. question again, yeah. I hope. Yeah. I uh, never use the Wafari. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, Omar Nadar asks, do you do bypass in one-step surgery or in two-step surgery? For example, first harvesting the superficial temporal artery, then the next step of the bypass. Two-step surgery. Does that yes, make sense? Uh, if you if you want to the bypass, you uh, at first you ha you have to have it to the STA. Yes, it's a, it's a one stage uh, surgery. Okay. Yeah, Pablo mm -hmm. Villanueva says that thank you. He's doing a book on placenta training, uh, and this webinar was a, a good uh, source of information. Okay, Mamon asked another question. What complication? do you face in the bypass? Uh, uh, for the Moyamaya case, actually uh, a lot of uh, complications, including uh, the seizure, the edema of the brain, and the, the, some uh, hypoperfusion or hypoperfusion, uh, some, uh, even some uh, hemorrhage or uh, some uh, infarction. So in my theory, uh, is, uh, the, uh, the uh, complication rate is quite low. Uh, it's around uh, uh, 3% for uh, pe uh, uh, perioperative uh, infarction. It's quite low, lower than uh, the normal level. It's around 5%. And uh, um, the mortality rate is quite uh, low. It's uh, around 1.5%. Uh, every 1,000 case. Yeah. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we got most of the questions. Uh, does anybody have a question they'd like to ask before we close? Yeah, yes, uh, John, can I uh, say Go something? Ahead, of, course, of course. Yeah, uh, good morning from Little Rock and good day to everybody. Thank you for these webinars and thanks for the dedication of Professor Ernest Nemi, Professor Zupin, and John for teaching young generation.
great lectures. Of course, uh, Professor Yazdrzil's lecture is beyond evaluation. Just a comment on the training, in addition to what's mentioned, uh, placenta and rats, of course, uh, the live cadaver uh, model, which uh, you can practice on the real anatomy. It's a great model for uh, practicing bypasses. And hopefully I will explain more in the coming uh, uh, webinar with Professor uh, Hermes Nehmi in the next meeting in November. Great. So thank you, thank yeah. you very much. Great, you're yeah, giving a lecture you. next week? That's great. Uh, really, thank you very much, Emad. So, it was a very nice comment. So, Emad has, uh, is it more than 10 years ago, you created the pulsating head? Yeah, maybe uh, 20 years, since 2000. 20 years, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The time is, time is flying. So, yes, uh, a very good model, uh, yeah. pulsating head connected yeah. to the cardiac pump. So, it, it looks like real, real Life surgery. brain and you can, you can do everything. So, this is great. Great yeah. invention, invention, and uh, really next week we have the Shaolin Congress. So uh, Emad Abut will tell about the cadaver lab in the uh, Arkansas Science Institute, Little Rock, and uh, Alec Christ will give a presentation of the importance of uh, cadaver dissection for microneurosurgery. It will be great lectures, and uh, please join us next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. This is Shaolin Congress, so our webinar will be then in two weeks again. Okay, very good. In Thanks. Two weeks, in two weeks, Friday. Yes. Two weeks, Next okay. Week. Yeah. Very good. Okay, thank you very much, Yula, and thanks all the panelists for participating, and a special thanks for Ben Zhu, who's multitasked and not only translated into Chinese, but did some screen sharing, too. Thank you very much, Ben. And we'll see you next uh, in two weeks. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. See you. See you. Greetings to Little Rock.